I'm really happy to be back at Purdue. I'm thrilled to be here sharing with you some ideas and some reflections on something that I entitled Mind or Brain, Matter or Spirit, Neuroscience and the Complexity of the Human Being. There is a key concern that I want to address through this presentation. It's related to some interpretations that appears in terms of neural, neuroscientific facts, research facts. They are not really scientific facts, but interpretation about them. And for example, one of them is that our neurons firing, firing inside our brain defines who we are, nothing else. Other statements that are interpretation, again, I say they are not scientific facts, but interpretations, is that there is no spiritual soul that has been found through the research in neuroscience. Therefore, we are nothing else but simple and aggregated matter. But let's see, think about it. Does these two interpretations really enable us to better understand and even inspire our daily lives, our personal history, or our whole personality? And there is a background of these interpretations. It's a historical conflict between two incompatible camps. Both of them, they have been in the tradition of the history of ideas. One of them is dualism that states that we are fundamentally spiritual and immaterial souls that have some kind of interaction with our body. The other camp is materialism, also in philosophy of mind, entitled physicalism. We are just neurons firing inside our brain. But let's go and think about this again. Is that so? Do we have to make a choice between this, these two positions? Perhaps, isn't it that a little simplistic? Is there an alternative or a third way? My personal academic background, that is really my biography, and really made me to be here and think about this, is that I have a PhD in electrical engineering in the area of pattern recognition and artificial intelligence. I have been working and teaching electrical engineering and computer engineering for 23 years. And I also have a doctorate degree in theology because I was, when I was studying here at Purdue, I was making questions. I was really hearing about the recent discoveries in neuroscience, and that made me go to think about it in depthness. I have a strong background in philosophy. I have taught courses in philosophy, engineering, ethics, and theology. And I do research in, in the dialogue between science and religion and philosophy because I think life is to search for truth. And one of the things that enabled me to discover, to reframe that conflict, is the issue of two paradigms in contemporary science, simplicity versus complexity. It was a French philosophy, philosopher, Edgar Morin, who described both paradigms. One of them, the paradigm of simplicity, that has two principles. The first one, the principle of separation that seeks to separate reality and different scientific fields of knowledge that study independently of the other each sector of reality. The second principle, the principle of reduction that seeks to simplify complex phenomena. The complex then is reduced to the most basic unities and what is assumed is that reality is nothing more than the basic, unit, basic unities Particularly, particularly of matter. Reduction, again, for example, is to see society, not only of interactions of individuals and persons, but to reduce it to interaction between multicellular organisms. And the multicellular organism to reduce it to interaction among cells, to reduce it to molecules and atoms and to elementary particles. And there is nothing more real, according to this vision, to this paradigm, than the elementary particles. Therefore, it reduces human life to the most, physical, most basic physical components. The other paradigm, 
also well described by Edgar Morin, is the paradigm of complexity. Reality is highly complex, with multiple levels of deep interaction between heterogeneous aspects. The most basic elements are necessary, but insufficient to understand a simple a system as a whole, reality as a whole. Then this paradigm proposed transdisciplinary research to differentiate aspects, but avoid cutting reality into pieces. This is against dualism. It seeks to associate without eliminating any essential aspect against reductionism. This paradigm of complexity is well summarized by a mathematician and philosopher of the 17th century, Blaise Pascal, who say, who say, and I quote, it is as impossible to know the parts without knowing the whole as to know the whole without knowing the particular parts. Let's see now these two paradigms in the particular cases of neuroscience. The paradigm of simplicity, again, with the principle of reduction and the principle of separation. In terms of reductionism, there is an example, Jean-Pierre Changeau, a French neuroscientist, who say the following in his book, L'Homme Neuronal, Neuronal Man. Our mind is just physical, chemical events in our brain. The mind, and in, fr in French, the mind is equivalent to, say, the spirit, the mind is equivalent to charged ions and neurotransmitters at the synaptic level. Nothing more. And then, to provoke the readers, he said the following, the human brain is composed of elements similar to those that compose a rat's brain and inorganic materials. You could not be more reductionist than that. But then there is the dualist position also. In terms of two thinkers, John Eccles, who is a neuroscientist, and Karl Popper, a philosopher. They, in some books, particularly this one that I'm presenting here, the self and its brain, they establish that there are two independent entities, mind and brain, typical dualist point of view, horizon, way of understanding reality. There is some level of interaction between both of them, but they are independent. But let's see now how the paradigm of complexity is emerging in neuroscience. Contemporary neuroscientists like Jan Roth, Edelman, Antononi, and many others are saying, are saying the following. The brain works not as independent neurons, firing each one at the different times. No, they work as an articulated network composed of many neuronal groups. These neuronal networks interact, influence, and affect each other at any time, even in a very complex way. But not only that, what is really interesting is that they are influenced by the ecosystem. The, the interaction between the organism, the complex reality, and the, organi and the, and the ecosystem really make fire in, dif in different ways our neuronal networks. And that's something that was left behind by the other two paradigms, dualism and materialism. The human, mind is, the human mind is not localized in a particular place of the nervous system. It is extended over the whole nervous complex system. And the nervous system operates at a unity, and this is also really important, because it says that a unity, that unity of the whole nervous system is more complex than the addition, the summation of different mind functions localized in different places. It's more complex than that. One of the neuroscientists have been, that have been proposing this, among others, is Antonio Damasio. Antonio Damasio, in many of his books, expressed that the mind is not a substance, it's not a thing, but a process, a dynamic and complex process that emerges from the brain. And consciousness is a particular state of mind in which there is knowledge of one's own existence, that that we call I. Also, he says something really interesting. The soul or a spirit is embodied and not a thing or a substance. It is a complex and unique state of an organism. That's why you will not follow, you will not find in a lab a thing called soul in the brain. And then to summarize and to make a good interpretation of this 
scientific facts, I propose to follow Javier Subiri, a great Spanish philosopher who knew a lot about science, who took into consideration seriously science. He will propose that the human being is a psychic, organic, systematic unit. The human being is a unity, but it's not any kind of un unity. It is not cafe latte. It's not latte, although I love cup of coffee, good cup of coffee every morning, and more than once. The human being is a unity, but not an aggregation of different components like milk and coffee. It's more complex, deeper than that. It is not a mix of sand and cement in concrete. It's more complex than that. What he proposed, following scientific facts, is that the human being Human beings are a systematic unity, and he meant by that a strong unity of essential properties or functions. A systematic unity has to be seen as a totality, as a whole, not a separation, not reduction. If an essential property for Subiri, if an essential property or function disappears, like let's say, for example, P2, a property 2, disappears, the system or a structure collapses, or becomes something else. And that's important, I repeat it. If, a, if an essential property disappears, the system collapses or becomes some, something else. Some properties definitely are not essential, like a skin color, hair, etc. They can disappear, you will still have your own humanity. But in the human being, there are two classes of essential properties, organic and psychic properties or functions operating as a whole, as a whole system. What are these organic and psychic properties? The human organism is an ensemble of physical, chemical, biological properties and functions. Human organism cannot exist independently of the whole human system. It is not, human organism is not the whole human being. This is again reductionism. Where do we live our ideas, our emotions, our values, freedom, our projects, dreams, personal history, and relationship with environments and others. However, without the organic qualities and functions, we will not be humans. We will be something else. This is against dualism. The other set of properties is the human psyche. The human psyche is the ensemble of essential human psychic properties such as intelligence, emotions or feelings that plays a role even in education, we know that now, and will or freedom. You can even add the process of being aware, consciousness. The human psyche cannot exist independently of the whole human being, the whole human system. This is again dualism. Can we think without our brains? Of course not. However, without these qualities, without these psychic functions, we will not be humans against reductionism. We will be something else. Then they, they don't work separated, but there is a co-determination among them. Organic properties are united to and determine the psychic properties, and the psychic properties are united to and determine the organic properties. That's why we, human beings, we do not have a psyche and we don't have an organism. That will be to make those ensembles things, substance. That's a problem. We are, as a whole, psychic organic. All human activities are psychic organic. Our intelligence is psychic organic. Our emotions is psychic organic. Our digestive process is psychic organic as well. And everything is connected in the human being, paradigm of complexity, united and operated as a whole. The will and freedom and our projects depend on the nervous system. The nervous system, from the nervous system emerge our intelligence. Our emotional state plays a role in our intelligence. If our glucose level for some reason changes, that will affect our nervous system and will affect the, the whole other functions and parameters and properties. And those are not the only ones in the human being. Science are in, is uncovering, uncovering every day new properties, new process, new functions. But they don't work separated from our 
feel, a feel that's around us. Cultures, culture, the culture where we grow up, where we were educated, plays a role. Even our nervous system changed with our, our education, our interaction with culture. Also, our interaction with others form our brain and nervous system, our way of thinking, our way of life, our relationship with society as well, and nature. We cannot leave nature outside. Without one of these properties, functions, or relations, we will not be human beings. We will be something else. And then to summarize, I have been presenting here the paradigm of simplicity. And now we can understand that dualism and materialism both belong to the paradigm of simplicity. Dualism in terms of the principle of separation, separating soul and body with some kind of interaction. And that vision in conflict with materialism that reduce the human being to the addition of neurons. But then we are proposing, we are proposing an alternative through the paradigm of complexity. What we are is a psychic organic system within an ecosystem of relationship. We exist in a field of relationship, and that's a holistic vision. The paradigm of complexity proposes that the human being is a complex, systematic unity of inseparably organic and psychic properties and functions. We are open, complex system, not a closed terrarium. We exist within a complex field of relations. Therefore, we are a personal open terrarium within the global earth. And as a question, just to end, and to think, keep thinking about it. Which paradigm enables us to better understand who we are in our inner core, who we are? our dreams, which one enables us to understand our dreams, our personal projects, our values, goals, and commitments, which one inspire us to build our personal life? Dualism, materialism, and complexity through the psychic organic vision. Thank you very much.